Hey, well, we had um, Pastor Bob here yesterday. He put in a he put in a, um, a microwave and he re- redid some of the some of the kitchen cabinets. Some of the ladies from our church and and Bob were over painting <laughs> painting the house and um, my goodness. You you guys, I was looking for, you know, spots on the carpet and stuff on the trim, but there wasn't any. What a great job they did. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. So anyway, the house is, um, the house is really looking nice and, uh, a little bit of re- re- de- or rearranging of some of the things in the kitchen. The kitchen looks great. And so um, there was no plug-in for the microwave, so that was put in. And so progress is being made. And um, Pastor Bob said to me at least four times this week, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And so I said, so are we. And so teamwork matters. So I want to talk a little bit about teamwork and... Um, so, uh, somewhat of a repeat from last week and this week's Sunday school class, but I just felt like I should go to Nehemiah because there's so many things about teamwork that's coming up in the future. And so, Paula, you did a good job, but I'm going to do an overview of what you did and some other things. Um, we have a wonderful team here. I don't know if you guys realize what a great team there is, and there's great unity here. And... Um, you know, I shouldn't be surprised it's church, but I've, but I've been places where it isn't that way all the time. And so I just want to thank this church. Thank you for the privilege of um, uh, letting me be a part of this. And, um, but it's a proven fact, uh, unless um, I like to ask the question, what, what has a hold of you? You know, uh, someone said, don't get into, don't get into my personal stuff, you know, well, I'm not going to do that, but it's a proven fact, unless something really gets a hold of us, nothing really ever happens, you know, and um, we tend to put ourselves to extreme lengths when we are really sold out and really passionate about something, we go way beyond what we normally do when we're really passionate about someone, and um, what really drives you is a question I want to talk about today, what gets you going what gets your, uh, get your engine running? I, I always like to get somebody's engine running because then I don't have to do as much work when they get excited about it. There are all sorts of things, good and bad, that um, get a hold of people. Some of you have shared with me that you were in d- a drug addict or alcoholic, and um, I always like to hear those testimonies. And... Um, I don't know if I told you this before, but um, I, I, I grew up on drugs. On, uh, they drugged me to church on Sunday school. They drugged me to morning worship. They drugged me to Sunday night. They drugged me to Wednesday night. They drugged me to prayer meetings. I had to go to teacher's training classes when I was a teenager, and that was the last thing I wanted to do, but they drugged me there. But I lived through it. I turned out okay. <laughs> Uh, things that really get a hold of us in the world, um, our friends can get a hold of us, our temper, our money, uh, our family can get a hold of us. I hope it's gotten a hold of you, your family. Uh, sports can really get a hold of us. The Green Bay Packers can get a hold of us. But the, the Minnesota never has to worry because the Vikings never really get a hold of us. <laughs> so... But uh, it's okay. It's okay to have stuff get a hold of you if you do it positive. The world, fear, greed, lust can get a hold of us. So we have to learn how to um, cope with that. We learn how to fight it. Church can get a hold of us. Some people actually get too much church because they never go. They just in our church all the time and they're never in the world. And so I don't want to go there because I don't want to slow anybody down. But anyway, we have to be available. So I ask the question, what really matters to you? 
what really matters to you in your life? Is there anything that you would give it all for? You know, we do have something. We'd do that for our family, wouldn't we? Give it all to our family. Uh, church, community, ministry, faith. Many of you, I've noticed, you give it all to your faith and you're willing to do it. Something got a hold of Nehemiah. Now, I thought Nehemiah was the shortest person in the, in the Bible until I read Job. And I, I heard about uh, Bildad the Shuhite. Do I have, that's how taller he was. I don't know if it's that one. Is that the one or is there another one that, yeah, the Shuhite. Well, um, you say, now why, why do you bring up something that's stupid? Well, I think it should be fun to be in church, don't you? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, these things in the Bible, we talk about giants and we talk about the smallest people, but um, I'm not sure how that all works out, but I do know this. Nehemiah was reading, was hearing about what was going on to the Jews in Jerusalem and back home where his parents were, were born and buried. It says that, um, now I'm going to be reading from Nehemiah chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and so some of the times it'll be on the screen, sometimes it won't. But here's what Nehemiah said. I was in the citadel at Susa. Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah and some of the other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived in the exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile uh, are back there in the, in the providence are in great trouble and, and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and their gates are burned with fire. When Nehemiah heard about the Jews and Judah and Jerusalem, so for some reason it got a hold of him. Now we read stuff in the paper and we read stuff all the time. It, it's, just some more, it's just some more news. But for some reason, this thing gripped Nehemiah and um, it deeply affected him. He become burdened for it. Now, I want you. To, I want you to be careful. Um, if something starts to burden you, you know, slough it off, or it'll get really get to you. <laughs> if something starts to burden you, pretty soon, it consumes you. When that starts happening, it's it's kind of like a nod from God that He's going to use you for that. But he 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 was overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed by it, and uh, it was troubling to him. When something is overwhelming, we need to do what Nehemiah did. He took it to the Lord. I like what it says in Psalms chapter 62, verse 1. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. One translation puts it like this. When I, cut, when I get to wit, my wit's end, lead me to Jesus. Or when I don't know where to turn. Why do we always have the Lord be last sometimes? We, not always, but uh, when there's no... Nothing else that I know how to do, lead me to the Lord. We we're told that when Nehemiah heard this, um, when I heard these words, chapter 1, verse 4, I sat down and I wept for many days. I mourned and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Something really got a hold of him. When something starts to burden you, uh, don't just let it slip away. Ask the Lord how he wants you to deal with it how he wants you to. Uh, and, he, and so Nehemiah, I like this, he reminds God, you see, when you get in trouble, you got to find your way out. It, remind God what he promised he would do when we get in trouble. Here's what, he, here's what he said, Lord, in verse number five, then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love for, with those he loves and keeps his commandments. You know, sometimes someone said this, there's sometimes we need to throw the book back at God. You know what that means? God, you said these promises, but they're not really working out for me. <laughs> so I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do because I'm in trouble spiritually or physically or financially or any, any other way. And so... Um, Here's what he did in verses 6 and 7. I confessed the sins 
uh, we Israelites, including myself and my father, my family have committed against you. I want to get my, my heart right. It says in uh, the, the Lord's Prayer, um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Sometimes I don't want God to forgive me the way I forgive others, <laughs> you know, because that wouldn't be so good. But he says, um, and so he said, we have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commandments, decreed in the laws that you gave to us. Um, you know, the Bible says, if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. And so sometimes we have to do a cleanup in our own spirit so God can hear us. And he, he said, we've, we've been terrible. I want you to forgive us. I want you to help us. We need help. Verse 11, then he prayed for favor. Give your servant um, success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. He was going to go see the king. Um, we need favor in a lot of things when we're going to do the Lord's work. Um, I needed favor when I was trying to get our first loan for our church. Uh, we need favor for um, the, there are key people that can open and shut the door. I talked to someone yesterday on the phone on the way down here, and hands free, by the way. And um, he said, our pa a pastor in our town is leaving. And he said, but he never went down to be part of the chamber or to be part of the Kiwanis or Rotary. He didn't. He spent his whole time all week in the office. He never went around and met people. And so um, I, I told I told uh, I told them we have a pastor coming to Laverne that, that doesn't like that idea. He wants to get out and about. And I believe with all my heart that God can open the doors, give us favor. So I've been praying for the Lord to give us favor in the community as a new pastor comes. Um, if you're going to accomplish anything for the kingdom, uh, something really needs to get a hold of your heart. And so um, I remember when the Lord first called me to preach and I was only 14, I really thought, I really thought we, I could do something for the Lord way back then. And then I believe when the Lord called me to something got a hold of my heart for hibbing Minnesota. I couldn't, you know, this is actually true. I, I didn't get to go for a couple of years, but it, I would hear the um, I would hear the weather report, hibbing, the p coldest spot in the nation. I said, "That's my town. <laughs> That's my town. I want to go there." And yeah, I know I'm crazy, but um, then when I got to the district office. I remember the daily burden that I had for the state of Minnesota. And then just recently, I've been to Bemidji. When I got to Bemidji, you know what I did? First night, I walked around the church. I said, Lord, put this town and put this church in my heart. Because I want to I wanna be so much a part of me that I, I did the same in, uh, in Burnsville. I did the same in um, Apple Valley. I didn't do that here. Because God put it in my heart before I got here. I didn't have to walk around the church and say, Lord, put this. The Lord said, something special is going to happen in Laverne, and you get to be a part of it. The Lord was talking to me. I mean, I don't have this running conversation with the Lord. I just, these ideas come. I, I don't want you to think I'm more spiritual than I am because I'm just kind of normal, uh, kind of normal. I'm not real normal, but anyway. Um, I really believe God gave us an assignment that we've accomplished in doing this for the Lord. Um, here's what I discovered. Um, you might care about a lot of things that take place, but um, when it's your responsibility, you know what the Lord said to you, said to me? It's your responsibility to get the right pastor. Don't let him, don't let him, um, Take something that isn't at the high level. We're going to set the bar real hard. Remember what I said to the board? We're going to set this bar real high and we're not going to let it down. And um, every church I've been in except this one, they wanted me to let the bar down a little bit because we weren't getting there fast enough. 
but I couldn't keep up with what was happening here, so I'm thankful for that. And uh, it becomes a burden to us when we really are responsible for what's going on. Uh, then you need to do what Nehemiah did. He reminded the Lord of his promises. Uh, he dealt with his past, and he asked for favor. I'm asking for favor for Pastor Bob when he comes. Chapter 1, verse 10. I was the cupbearer of the king. Now, um, as I was reading through this, I, I, I heard that he was fasting, so he must not have had to work seven days a week. But I like, the, I like what the cupbearer the cupbearer's responsibility was to taste the king's food before the king in case someone was trying to poison him. Well, I like tasting it, but I don't like the idea that it might be poison. But any of you grow up on a farm? I worked on, I worked on a farm. I didn't grow up there, but uh, then I would stay. It was my uncle's farm. I got to stay overnight with him and stuff, and I was just a middle teen. But I really liked the way they did it. After chores, we had breakfast. Then about 10 o'clock, the ladies would drive out to the field and, and bring a, you know, like a sandwich and cake and Kool-Aid or something. Then we'd come in for lunch. Now this is, this is something I can live with. You know, we'd come in and have lunch, and in the afternoon about 3, the ladies would find us and bring out some goodies again. And then... Uh, like a three-course meal for supper and then ice cream before you went to bed. Now, I, I, want, to do, if I want to do that for the king, you know what I mean? Because his food would probably be the best. But anyway, um, what a job. And he said, I've never, I was never sad in the king's presence. If you work for the king, you could not be sad in his presence. It just wasn't acceptable. But here's what, here's what he said. Um, in the month of, of Sinon, in verse chapter 2, verse 1, um, uh, the twelfth year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to him. I had not been sad in his presence before. Verse number 2. So the king said to me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This must be nothing but sadness of heart. Verse number 3. Uh, I was very afraid, very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should not my face look sad uh, when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates are burned with fire? Now, I don't know how much time was in between this, but the king asks him two questions. And it looks to me like the king had already made a decision before he asked the question. Here's what he said. What is it you want? How long are you going to be gone? <laughs> when he asked those two questions, it's like he already decided he could go, right? What is it you want? And uh, how long are you going to be gone? Actually, he was gone about 12 years, um, but um, it didn't take that long, but he had to get everything together over there. And... Um, it pleased the king to send me, so in verse number six, so I set a time, and the king also sent a letter, helped me with army officers and a cavalry with me. It was just a miracle. It wasn't even the king's business. It was another country. And God, God sets stuff up that we don't understand. God does things way beyond what we ever thought. And so favor with the king didn't mean favor with everybody else because all of a sudden the enemy uh, began to be disturbed and when Sanballat the Horonite and uh, Tobiah the Ammonite uh, officials heard about this, they were very disturbed and, there, and someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. When you step out in faith to do something important, there's usually opposition. Sometimes it's from Outside, sometimes it's from within, but the opposition uh, didn't stop Nehemiah. He was ready to go no matter what, because the Lord had sent him, the Lord had called him, the Lord had assigned it to him, and so he said, uh, he, said uh, he scoped it out, his mission at night, he said, I, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do in Jerusalem, and there were no, there, there were no, uh, mounts with me except the one I was riding on. 
Now, here's something that I, don't fi I can't figure out. I've tried to put good plans together, tried to make it so it was actually possible to do it, and I couldn't get people to go with me. He didn't even tell them what he was doing. He got people to go with him. How, how do you do that? But anyway, here's what it says. By night, I went out through the valley gate and toward the jackal well uh, and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates had been destroyed by fire. I told no one what I was going to do. I told the district I wanted to go to Hibbing, and it didn't work out very well. Uh, but then one day, <coughs> you see, I went to see what Jim, Jim Philbeck's boss, when the superintendent said I couldn't go, I went to see the secretary treasurer every month. Just any, any news about Hibbing, any, and it was always, no, Clarence, you know, like, quit, he didn't say it, but he could feel it, quit coming. One time I went in June, and he said, well, why don't you go up there so you can pray more intelligently about it? <laughs> That's all I needed. So, but you know how, well, you don't know how stupid I am, but I'll, I'll tell you, <laughs> I got up there. I didn't even look up the address. I didn't even look up in the district directory the address. Vicki and I, she went with me. We were engaged at the time. We left early in the morning and came back at night. And uh, But we... I drove through town and I saw Hibbing Gospel Tabernacle. Well, that's what the Assembly of God churches used to be called. So Vicky and I pull into the driveway, and we, we, it was kind of a broken down church. And we went in, and I looked around, I said, wow, this could really become something. And I, there were a balcony up there, and I thought, man, we could fix this up. We went downstairs, and it's like someone was living in the basement, and uh, we didn't, I knew the former pastor, the lady was living in the church. And so um, we, I didn't think too much of it, but uh, so we went out to the family that was one, there were two families that said they were coming, went out to their house. And I said, man, we could fix up the balcony. They said, that isn't our church. I was, I was in someone else's church in their apartment. And <laughs> they weren't home, thank God. But uh, that's, how, that's how stupid and naive we were. We were gonna go, and so then, we go to the right building. They told us where it was. It was it was terrible. And here's the thing that's neat. The only guy with a key drives up behind me. I'd been to his house that day, but the key wasn't there. The guy with the key, after I made all that rigmarole, the guy with the key drives up behind me and said, oh, Clarence, what are you here for? Because I'd talked to him about him before. I said, well, I want to look it over. We're, gonna pray. We're praying about it. He said, well, I brought the key with me. Can you imagine? If I'd have went there at the, right, at the right time, he wouldn't have been there, never got to go in. It was a little depressing, though, to go in anyway, but anyway, um, I was embarrassed then, but now it's just something that we all laugh about together. And so, Nehemiah didn't get discouraged. Vicki and I didn't get discouraged at how bad it was, because God had called us to the, why, did Nehemiah, why was he so passionate? What, what got a hold of Nehemiah was from the Lord. Let me just tell you this. When something from the Lord gets a hold of you, it doesn't matter how good it is or how bad it is. It's just exciting to do it. Something got a hold, what got a hold of Nehemiah was from the Lord. Uh, Nehemiah heard about the need. He scoped out the mission. Uh, he, he, he came and rallied the troops together. And... Um, his great dream was going to become a reality. Verse number 17, then I said to them, you see the trouble that we are in? Jerusalem lies in, in, in ruin and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be a disgrace. Verse number 18, chapter two. I told them of the good hand of God which had been upon me and also on the king's words and how he had spoken to me. I told them that God had been going before me. And then it says on the next verse, this one I think I have up. So they, so they said, let's arise. Can you believe this? Let's arise. He's only been there 10 days. Let's arise and build. Then they set their hands to do this great work. Here's some of the passionate vision. And uh, when, when you have a passionate vision and uh, Confirm, a little confirmation from the Lord, it gets very contagious. 
this congregation is going to be a part of a very contagious, exciting future just a few weeks from now as this thing starts rolling down a new way. The enemy laughed and despised, accused them of rebelling against the king and all kinds of other things. Chapter 3 is a, is a miracle chapter that I, I just love. Chapter 3 of, of Nehemiah. Uh, listen, listen to this now. <laughs> Everyone did their backyard because of what, you know, the people's their houses were right in front. But listen to chapter 3 and... Um, it says, uh, it says, Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with their brethren and the priests, and they built the sheep gate. Now, now this, I'm not going to read all this, but there are 46 people that got involved in 32 verses. Listen to verse 2. Next to Eliashib, verse number, uh, verse number 3, the men of uh, Hesana built uh, the fish... Verse 4, next to him. Verse 5, next to him. All through this, the people next to each other just did their backyard. You know, when everybody does a little bit, it was unbelievable what happened. Vicki and I were, uh, a year and a half ago, we were in the amazing uh, place in Ohio, the Amish uh, community. And the Amish people... Build, build barns like this in one day. They all come together. They all have the plan together. And within one day, the Amish people build barns for their neighbors, their relatives, and their friends. Um, it seems impossible. Like someone said, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. But you need a lot of people to take some bites with you. So you need a lot. But anyway... Um, if all of us do our part, there's no problem where the church can go and what the church can do. Um, I'm praying that every one of us will get a burden to do not what's right in front of you. The gifts you have, you're going to give them to the Lord. No, no discouragement can win. No uh, situation that's impossible. No job is too big or does a little bit. <laughs> I'm not always... I don't always have good common sense. We've been building a church for four years. It took us four years to build our church because we didn't, we didn't, we couldn't afford to hire anybody. So we did it all by volunteer labor. And so um, it's a, it's July first, and the, the churches. We never dedicated any of the churches that we built because. Um, we were using them long before they were finished. And so we just, so here we are. Um, and, I, and we just finished the building, but there was no siding. And there was, the, the church was one thing, the house was another. And so I was praying. I, I don't want to blame the Lord for this, but this is a thought that I had. What if we would side the sanctuary with cedar siding the second Saturday of September? Do the whole thing. 110 feet long, 40 feet wide, the house and the garage. So I heard myself telling my wife and our staff, let's try to side the sanctuary and see they're siding the second Saturday of September. I thought, <laughs> pastor, you know. And then I heard myself saying it to the board. Now these guys were, they had sense. You know, they were kind of, I said, guys, I've been t I told the staff, I told my wife, and I think we should side this sa sanctuary with Cedar Siding the second Saturday of September. They said, Pastor, we're all tired. I said, I know, but let's, let's get all the kinds of people that have never done it, haven't been working on it. I mean, most of these, the whole board had been working on the church, you know, for four years. And so um, then I heard myself in the first week in August say it to the sanctuary on Sunday morning about 500 people there. Well, I had to say it twice because we had two services, but I said, um, you know, the board and the staff and I, we decided that we're going to take the challenge of to side the sanctuary with Cedar Siding the second Saturday of September. What do you think? Just like, it's quiet. <laughs> he has gone nuts after these four years. You know. But anyway, after church, this guy comes up to me. His name was Taylor. His last name was Taylor. He said, hey, my brother... My brother's a, a contractor 
a siding contractor, and they say that he's the best in, on the Iron Range. I said, what's his name? Give me his number. He said, well, he doesn't go to church. I said, I'm not going to ask him to go to church. I'm going to ask him to do what he does best, put siding on. So I called him up. I said, Jim, we have to side our church. I'd like to meet with you. Well, he thought it was a contract, you know. So I met with him, and we talked, and I was... Uh, I said, um, we're, we're going to do something crazy, and um, I want you to help us. He said, well, I don't go to church. I said, I'm not going to ask you to go to church. I'm going to ask you to do what you really do best. I said, there's a rumor in town about you. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> when you tell someone there's a rumor, they always want to hear it. I said, the rumor is you're the best siding contractor on the Iron Range. Is that true? And they said, well, uh, you know, how you feel when someone says that. And so I said to him, um, here's what we're going to do. I, I've already talked to six guys. I'm going to have seven foremen, a foreman on each corner of the church. I'm going to have a scaffold foreman. We borrowed every scaffold in town. And uh, we're going to have a foreman on the garage and two foremans on the house. And we're going to, in one day, we're going to side the house, the garage. And uh, I don't know how to do this, but I've got some guys that are kind of carpenters. So I'm going to have seven foremen, and I want you to be go around and tell all the foremen how to do what they're doing. We're going to meet on the second Saturday of September because we're going to side the sanctuary cedar siding. We'd like to meet at 6 in the morning. And then you can tell us what to do. And I'm going to get red suspenders, and I'm going to walk around with you and act like I know what I'm doing because I'm with you, Jim. Jim said, I never heard anything like this before, but you know what? I just have a feeling I should do it. So, uh, from 6 in the morning till 9.45 that night, uh, we, had, we had 125 different people come. 80 were there at the same time at 3 in the morning. We started someone barbecuing a pig. That was just for Delbert. And, uh, <laughs> we were bar bar barbecuing a pig so when people came, they could smell it, you know? And then we were feeding people all day. Well, of course, we, started, we took off the siding before that. But that day, we had all the scaffolding up, a scaffold foreman so he could always keep moving all the scaffolds. And at 9, 9.45 at night, the banker who said we couldn't do it, he was up on the scaffold, put the last piece in. I said, Gene, did we make it? Pastor, quit bugging me. <laughs> we made it. All of us made it. And it was exciting. Everybody did a little bit. I mean, we opened, we reopened the lumber yard at one in the afternoon and at three in the afternoon because we were running out of steam. But the guy was from our church, so that wasn't a problem. But um, what, what we did, some people painted, some people did the food, some people did all the all the stuff that we had to do. But everybody did what they were good at. Um, now, this isn't part of my message, but uh, um, I'm going to do it anyway, and some people always get mad at you when you do stuff like this, so I won't, if you've got a frown on your face or something, I won't look back, but anyway, the parsonage is not the pastor's parsonage, it's the church's parsonage. The pastor's going to live in it, and when he gets done, he's going to leave like the past, last pastor did, and we still have the parsonage. But the windows are horrible. You can actually see out beside some of the windows. So the board had someone give us a bid, and for 6500 we can replace all the windows. I said, don't ask me about it. Ask the new pastor. I'm not the one. So the board and the pastor unanimously said we're going to do it, 6500 bucks. So... One of the things I get to do, I love doing it, is raising money. At the first church I was at in Bemidji, we finished the parking lot, but we were 22,000 short when I got there. I said, well, we can do this. So we finished the parking lot, a couple other projects and other churches. I was telling my wife, there's no project for me to do while I'm here. I'm getting frustrated. And so she said, well, something will come up. So. Vicky and I are going to give 100 a month in January, so I got to get it in there fast. 100 a month in February, 100 a month in March. 
And I'd like, I'd like all of us to think about it, pray about it. Don't do it just because I do it or don't. Do it. But ask the Lord what you should do. And let's do it in 90 days to six months. We can raise all this money right in our church. I mean, it's, it's already sitting in the pews. Uh, I, I had a friend that he had, he had three offerings one morning. I don't know why he did that, but he had a missionary or something. And then he went out to eat and he said to his wife, we didn't get it all. People are going out to eat, you know, it's like we didn't rob anybody. Well, someone said, I've had people say to me before when I'm raising some money, I said, why, why don't you give more? Well, I said, let's all do a little. Somebody might think, why don't you give 100 a month for the next six weeks? Because I don't have that much to give, but I can do 300, I can do a little, okay? So what is God telling you to do? And... Um, by the way, if you're a visitor and just you're not you're not in on this, we're not asking you to do it. You're just a guest. So, but the rest of us are stuck, and nobody's going to nobody's going to get in your face, and nobody's going to ask you what you're going to give or anything like that. But let the Lord tell us. And you say, how did you make this a part of the sermon? Well, I just saw everybody did a little bit, so that's how I got there. Um, I got another quick story, if you guys don't mind. We had a, a lady comes up to me in Hibby. I was pastoring. She says, Pastor, can we have missionettes? So this is a lady that the ladies are always supposed to be ahead of the men. Anybody know any ladies like that? And so anyway, the ro five men had started Royal Rangers. And we didn't have missionettes. And this lady was going crazy. She comes up to me and said, can we have missionettes? I said, no. She says, how come? I said, we don't have a leader. She said, oh, two weeks later, she comes up and said, can we have missionettes? I said, no. She said, how come? She said, don't have a leader. She said, what if I was a leader? I said, oh, let's talk. Well, anyway, um, she, she got it going, and about a year later, she comes up to me and said, no one has a burden for missionettes. See, we're talking about burdens here. No one has a burden for missionettes. I said, well, let's look. So we go back and we look through the Wednesday night and there were 23 people in Wednesday night in the Mission Net program. And I said, well, it looks like it's going pretty good. So about six months later, she said, nobody has a burden for missionettes but me. And I said, well, let's go look. There were 38 in missionettes. And one more time we met and there were a few more people. I said, Mary, if someone had a greater burden for missionettes than you, they would be the leader and you would be following. You have the greatest burden because you're the, you're the one doing it. No one has a greater burden for the church than the pastor. And no parishioners have a greater burden for the church than the board. It's just a part of our, our leadership. And so um, Mary, some days, had over 100 admissionettes on a Wednesday night, special times. San Ballot kept bugging him. He said, look at these feeble Jews. Verses four, one through chapter four, one through three. If you four, nothing is going to work, they're going to. They think they can make sacrifices here. It's not going to happen. Tobias said, if a fox got on the wall, it would fall down. Nehemiah prayed and kept pressing into God, and I got to move along. Can't go through all these notes, but uh, let me just skip a couple pages. You know what they wanted to do? They were evil. They were trying to get him to come someplace so they could, they said, why don't you come come to Ono and we'll have a little conference. And he said, he said no four times. And then, um, then they said, let's meet in the sanctuary. But he had an idea to kill him. But he said, I'm not going to do it. I'm too, he, here's what he said. I'm doing a great work and I'm too busy to come down can't go have a meeting. I'm fi finishing this wall. And then um, four times at it. And then this is a part I like. I didn't want to skip this. They said, we'll come to Ono, and we'll, I want to meet you at Ono, and we'll have a conference there. Here's what he said. Oh, no, I will not go to Ono. I'm doing a great work. Oh, no, I won't go to no Ono. I'm where I should be. 
Oh no, I won't go to no, no. Oh no, I'm where God wants me to be. There are some times when you can't be called away. Oh no, I won't go to oh no because I'm focused. Oh no, I won't go to oh no because I shall not be moved. I've heard from the God and from the Lord, and I'm too busy doing what God's called me to do. When you start serving the Lord, there'll be, always be something that calls you away. Your old life, um, old sin will knock on your door. You say, well, that doesn't happen. It happens to me all the time. Something comes to my mind that I don't want to. Compromise will come to you. Well, unfortunately, um, sometimes uh, I know that there, there are divine interruptions, but uh, I don't want to be distracted by every little thing. I think we got some distraction ideas here somewhere. Maybe that didn't make it. There it is. Please don't talk to me. I have no self-control. And I'll talk to you for two hours. For two hours. And I'll never get back to my work. As we, as we um, come to the end, we find that there were other people that tried to distract him and get him away from what he was supposed to do. Um, when God calls us to an important task, um, it's amazing how it happens. In 52 days, the wall was built. The wall was laying there for 150 years, and they rebuilt it in 52 days. What's God want you to do? Um, what's the thing that God's putting on your heart for you to do? Some people say, oh, nothing, I hope. I'm not listening. I don't want him to talk to me. God wants to talk to you because you're one of his children and he wants to use you for his glory. I know in my life I want to hear from God for my next assignment. I'm getting excited about where I go from here. I want to speak. I want the Lord to speak to my spirit and to hold me accountable for what I'm supposed to do in my life. Um, I want to be committed. Um, I want to be about God's work doing something important when he comes. I want to do that. So I just ask you the question. Are you guys going to sing another song? Go ahead. Let's do it. I want to ask you the question. We're ready for you. I want to ask you the question. What's your assignment? I like to look at everybody's face when I ask this. What's your assignment? Because this reason, because God has an assignment for everybody. He doesn't have an assignment just for preachers. That's a bunch of baloney. He has an assignment for everybody. And I wonder what your assignment is. I want to help you do what God's trying to get you to do. Because you're his child, and he has a special job for you to do. Listen to this. As we stand together, I'd like to stand while this it's a good song. Then we'll close. Some of you are discouraged. It's only an hour and ten minutes. A lot of churches go two hours. Ten minutes over. I'm sorry. God's blessing on you.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray, pray with me this week about what God would want us to do to pay off those windows. God bless you. Have a great week.